Well, good morning. God is good. And all the time. It is so good to welcome you to Finley Lake United Methodist Church. Uh, We are blessed again. It's a little cooler. It's pumpkin spice latte weather, but uh, we're glad to once again be able to worship in our parking lot here. We're so glad that you've joined us. Uh, If you are tuning in from home on Facebook Live or later through YouTube, we're so glad that you've joined us for worship this morning. God is present. God is going to speak, and he has good things in store for us, so we're excited about that. Um, If you're a guest with us, my name is Pastor Dave, and we just want to welcome you here as we uh, experience the presence of God and lift up the King of Kings, uh, the Lord of Lords, and the only one who is worthy of our worship and praise. Once again, how good it is to be in the presence of the Lord and to sing God's praises and uh, to to declare the truth that God holds on to us, that we are not alone. He never leaves us or forsakes us, but the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, he is holding on to us. No matter whether we are on a mountaintop or in a valley of despair, God is present. He is holding on, and that's good news for us. Uh, As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, we just want to remember all those who need uh, God's healing touch. Uh, We think of our nation and division. We think of uh, our world and those who are suffering around the world. We think of uh, how God has plans for us to be light, salt and light in the midst of our surroundings. And um, we cannot do any of these things without the Spirit of God. And so let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we come before you in prayer, thankful that you are a God who listens. You hear the cries of your people. You are attentive. You are a a loving father that invites your children to draw near through your spirit, through your grace. And Lord, we thank you that we can be here declaring your praises, for you are worthy. God, we, we acknowledge you as the one who created the land and the seas, the one who spun the planets into orbit, the one who uh, brings order and beauty and complexity to our world and to our lives, and so we can look at you in awe as our creator, and we thank you for that. God, we thank you that you are the sustainer. Jesus, you sustain our lives moment by moment, even in ways we don't see or understand. You hold us together. You keep us going. You Uh, give power to us. You enable us to to move forward in grace and strength because of uh, who you are at work within us. God, we pray that you would help us to to draw on your strength as we live this new week for you. Help us to be faithful in all things. God, we pray that uh, in our lives we we are not perfect. We are works in progress. And so, Lord, we we take time to acknowledge uh, our sinful words and actions from this past week that have uh, hurt others that have let you down. Um, Lord, we just take a moment to confess our sins before you. Lord, we thank you that you are merciful, that you are gracious unto us, that you throw our sins away as far as the east is from the west, that you cleanse us and make us new, and we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for your power to heal and to save and renew and to reconcile. And so this morning, we lift up all those who are broken in body, mind, and spirit. And we ask you, great physician, through your power to heal bodies, to to clean and make minds whole and well, to restore joy and peace and hope. God, we pray that you would heal damaged relationships. Anyone who needs reconciliation, we pray that they would trust you, that as they invite you into the center of their relationship, that you would bring grace and humility and healing that you would restore love and mutual affection and respect. God, we pray for our nation and our divided world, and we know the answer is not a political figure, but it's you, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be people who live through the power of the Holy Spirit, not through bitter, angry, cynical hearts, but through the power of the Holy Spirit who gives us love. We pray that we would uh, see the world as you see it, that you would help us to be your ambassadors, Lord, we pray that we would be uh, agents of reconciliation and grace wherever we go. Lord, we pray for those today who are hungry. Uh, We pray for those uh, within the reach of life care ministry, women who are hurting, who don't know where to turn, that they would, we pray that they would find you uh, through the loving volunteers of life care ministry and Corey. Bless that ministry. Help us to give generously. Lord, we pray for children uh, who need to know you, who need to know your hope. So we pray your blessings, your peace, your power upon uh, Matt Cox and all the staff and the the work of uh, Miracle Mountain Ranch. We pray your blessings upon the camp at Finley. We pray your blessing upon the churches of this region that we would equip and nurture our children to know you and walk with you as Savior and Lord. And Lord, we pray uh, for our time together in your word that you would speak powerfully for we, your servants, 
uh, are listening. We need your word. We need your guidance. And so we ask for you to speak. And we pray, Lord, that we would respond with faith, with trust, with obedience. And we pray this all in the wonderful name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as we turn to God's word this, this morning, in a moment, we'll be in Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. So I invite you to turn with me uh, to that, and, and we'll read that passage in a moment. But I want to begin by sharing a story that I've been uh, kind of giving you glimpses and, glimpses and pieces of. Uh, I've shared on Facebook about how we had an overwhelming project to do at my parents' house. I, I know I've shared a little bit about this, but just want to uh, introduce our theme today with this story. Um, as many of you know by now, one day I went, I found a little tiny piece of trim that had fallen off the window of my parents' house, and I thought, well, that's a quick fix. That's two nails, two brad nails, and it, it's done. It's put back together until I, I, I looked more closely and saw that there was a little bit of rot, and then I removed the aluminum siding. And if you don't remember, I moved, removed aluminum siding and found this was not a quick fix. Brown mulch, two by sixes and two by fours that had been rotting for years because of water damage, fell when I opened that aluminum siding, fell to the ground like wet brown mulch that you would find at Walmart and open up the bag and dump it out. That's what fell out from behind of behind the aluminum siding at my parents' house. This was no way, in no way a small project where you just tap a few nails or maybe put on some touch-up paint and, and move on with your life. This was a situation where the more we removed from that facade of that siding, the more we saw the rot and the damage and the decay that had happened over years and years of water infiltrating that space. Today we're going to look at the conflict between the Pharisees and Jesus, and the bottom line is, I'll get right to it, the difference is the Pharisees were concerned about touch-up paint and rules and regulations and hypocritical actions that made everything appear to be right and respectable and good-looking on the outside, while well, behind the facade, behind that religious exterior and hypocrisy, there is the rot of sin and structures that just were not ready to receive what Jesus was offering through the newness of the gospel and his Holy Spirit. See, we can be kind of like the Pharisees when we are more concerned about touch-up paint and a little bit of exterior work and appearance management so that we go out just trying to project the right image rather than truly wanting to be made new and holy and loving on the inside. See, Jesus is not about touch-up paint and slapping up a little bit of uh, exterior facade work. He's about doing the complete work of renovation from the inside out. And that's what we discovered with this project at my parents, that we couldn't just change the exterior. We had to remove and dismantle years and years of rotted two-by-fours, and we basically had to start over with new framing and new materials and new trim and new, new windows, new everything. It was not a touch-up job or an appearance problem. It was a total work of renovation that was needed. Just as water damaged my parents' old windows and framing over time, what creeps into our lives through sin? Unresolved anger, bitterness, violence, cynicism, selfishness, all these things can creep into our lives, lust, lust, the stubbornness of pride, the allure of greed. All these things can creep in and damage and rot us from the inside out. And no one, I don't want to make it look like this is anyone pointing fingers around here, no one of us, not one human except Jesus, is immune from the sin and the damage and the rot that can begin to infect the human heart. We are all uh, people who are affected by uh, the effects of sin, but thankfully, we have Jesus. Amen? And he is the one that transforms us from the inside out. And I want to talk about how Jesus does not simply offer us touch-up paint, but he offers a complete and total renovation and restoration of our hearts and lives. That is possible. Whatever is broken, whatever is hopeless, whatever is dark, whatever is dreary, whatever you think is rotting in your life, 
New renovation, newness of life, new hope is all possible through the grace and the power of Jesus Christ when he enters into our lives and takes control. He is the master craftsman. He was even a carpenter or a, a stonemason or a builder. He was the one who built new physical structures, but he also rebuilds and transforms hearts from the inside out. So let's dive into our passage this morning. We are in Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 22, and this scripture goes like this as we continue our series on parables. Um, this is, we're focusing on the parable of new wineskins. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We, we have God's word that teaches us that, that Jesus took everyday ordinary things in the world, whether it was trees or seeds or birds or wineskins, and he used these things that people saw in their everyday lives to, make, uh, to, to bring about and communicate spiritual truth. And, and he saw things uh, that, that other people could see, and he used them to, point, to paint word pictures of what the kingdom of God is like. And as we continue on with this parable of the wineskins, once again we're seeing that he is painting a sharp line of contrast between the Pharisees and their ways of thinking that is based on tradition and the oral interpretation of what was passed down and the written word of God and the grace that Jesus was wanting to flow into the lives of people. And so as we look at our passage today, Jesus and the Pharisees are again in the boiling pot of controversy, and what we see is that the heat is getting turned up. And the controversy is brewing with the Pharisees because uh, their self-righteousness that comes from the st strict interpretation of the religious law was butting heads with Jesus and his grace-based focus on the gospel that brings life and healing and salvation. The Pharisees' approach was all about uh, hypocrisy and control and trying to clean up the outside appearance so that everyone could look at them and, and see how respectable and how uh, good looking they were. But the gospel of Jesus is not about false appearances. The gospel of Jesus is about humility. It's about taking off our masks and being uh, open before God. It's about humility and repentance where we experience grace flowing in and sin and rot flowing out so that we can experience the, the, the transformation that Jesus wants to bring. And Jesus wants us to be uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. He wants our lives to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. You know, when I turn on the news, when I look at our world, what I see is that our world is in need of people who are first and foremost manifesting the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, is that what marks your life? That's what Jesus wants to do in us so that, we, uh, so that we represent who he is, so that we represent his essence through grace. The problem we see today, though, is that Pharisees and those like them are not ready to have the grace and the work of Jesus flow in because they don't want to yield and surrender. A Pharisee says, you know, with just a little bit of work, I'm going to be okay. With just a little bit of touch-up on the outside, I can control, you know, what I present to the world, and, and that's all that I need. As long as my appearance is good and I'm in power and I'm in control, all is well. But Jesus says, no, you need to yield control. You need to die to self. You need to humble yourself and experience transformation of heart and life. Jesus and his grace, his gospel, is like new wine that is flowing in. And the old wineskins of the Pharisees, their traditions, their structures, those old wineskins were not ready to contain the power and the newness of God's spirit. And so Jesus shares this parable to talk about how new wine needs to be put in new wineskins. Otherwise, the old wineskins will burst and the wine will spill all over the ground. 
So let's talk about wineskins for a little bit. Wine was kept in wineskins that were made from pliable goat skins. And so when new wine was put into new wineskins, it was a perfect match. Because as the wine fermented, it expanded, and the pressure would build. But the new wineskins had an elasticity that could accommodate the fermenting wine that was expanding. And so as the pressure of that fermenting wine uh, increased, the wineskins could accommodate to contain the, the new wine. But the old wineskins they would just burst because they had already stretched when the, new, when the wine put in it at first fermented and expanded. Those old wineskins, they did expand for a while until they reached their point that they became brittle and hard and they could no longer contain, they cannot contain new wine. They can only contain the wine the one time, but new wine is needed to be put in new wineskins. Many today are like old wineskins just like the Pharisees thought, well, we have our structures, we have our traditions, we have everything we need, we're fine as is, thank you. Many are like that in that they think, I am fine just as I am. I don't, I don't need to consider new possibilities. I, and, and so they're, they're like old wineskins because they're so stuck in their ways. They, they're too stubborn to think about how they need to change. Old wineskins believe that they can stay the same. I love the, the image of Matt swinging around the lasso and just putting one foot inside the lasso. That's what it's like. When you're an old wineskin, you think, I'm, I'm pretty much just how I need to be. I can just add a little bit of Jesus, and that will enrich my life to the point that I'm, I'm fine. I can go on with life as usual. Old wineskins think, I just need a little touch-up paint. I just need a little activity here or an activity there, and that's, that's all I want. Meanwhile, Jesus is saying, I don't want to offer touch-up paint. I want to completely move into your life and bring about renovation. People can be like old wineskins. Churches can be like old wineskins. You know what the old adage of an of a old wineskin church is, right? We've never done it that way before. So we can't do it in a new way because we've never done it that way before. And Jesus says, well, think about being a new wineskin because I'm always doing something new. I'm always doing new works in my grace. I'm always looking for ways to move in and bring hope in new ways. I'm looking to bring forgiveness in new ways. I'm looking to, to bring marriages um, stronger and closer together in new ways. So think about how you can adapt and accommodate and be a new wineskin because my grace is always fresh and new. And it, we look to God's word in 2 Corinthians uh, 5.17 where Paul writes uh, or records God's word saying, Behold, I am making all things new. In our lives, if we are seeking Jesus, we should not be afraid of the new things he wants to do. Uh, I'd like to touch on three characteristics of wineskins. And so as, if you're a note taker, these are just three points where we can think about uh, Jesus' work in our lives. First, wineskins were made to be filled with wine. That's like the duh statement, right? But we are 21st century disciples, just like they were in the first century. And so that's a, a, a duh statement. But we, wineskins are made to be filled with wine. And you and I, as a people of God, were created to be filled with the Spirit of God. And we cannot, we're not supposed to pray, Lord Jesus, just give me a little bit of your Spirit to make me a little nicer, to make me a little bit more like Christ, to, to take away a little bit of my pain, to give me a little bit more hope, and just to make me feel a little bit better about my life. That's not how the new wine of the Holy Spirit works. The new wine comes in to fill the wineskin. And we were called to be filled with the Spirit of God. And as the Holy Spirit flows into us, we gain power to love and to serve and, and live in a way that would please and honor Jesus. When we become followers of Jesus, the Holy Spirit does come in. But there's something about a daily denial of self and surrender that, that opens us up to the moving of God's power and God's Spirit in, in, a, in a greater measure. That's what repentance and faith is all about, yielding to the Spirit to, to clean us, to fill us, to empower us as followers of Jesus Christ. The question is not, oh yeah, I invited Jesus into my life, so I'm good to go, but each and every day, are we looking to do God-sized tasks where we say, God, I'm going into a world that is broken and dar dark and chaotic and confused? And I cannot reach them with the power and truth of the gospel effectively unless you are filling me with your power and your wisdom. 
So, Lord, fill me with an ability to speak and be a, an effective ambassador for you. Fill me with the boldness of faith I need to speak hope into someone's life. Fill me with the boldness to overcome my shyness, to take a pie and a card over to my next-door neighbor who is hurting, whose husband is battling cancer, whose, whose wife is going through a difficult time. Give me the boldness to overcome my shyness so that I can share you in just a loving, simple way. Fill me, Lord, so that I can be a... Uh, an effective witness and ambassador for you. Wineskins were made to be filled. And each and every day, our prayer should be, Lord, fill me and use me for your glory and your purposes. Second point about wineskins is new wineskins expand and receive. They're elastic and they're pliable. And the power and the presence of Jesus is, is want, God wants us to be open to the newness of how he is working that, that is in alignment with his word, but he wants us to be open to how, uh, to open to receive him each and every day. And so our posture should be to have an open heart that says, Lord, whatever you want to do in me, do it. I am open to you. My heart, if it is of you, if it is, of, it is, if it is good, if it is holy, my heart is elastic and ready to receive what you want to do in me. Again, the old wineskins say, I don't need to change. New wines can say, Lord, I turn from my sin. I look to you. Come into me. Change me and use me. All right, I have to just get really practical for a moment. Uh, I've been convicted. Uh, last week I talked about my struggle where I said, why am I getting into these political conversations that are leaving me dry and weary and exhausted and frustrated because I'm having more disagreement with believers over politics rather than unity with believers. Remember that from last week? And uh, obviously I wasn't the only one you know, dealing with that because a, a number of you came up and said, that's what I'm feeling, weariness over this political uh, wrangling and vitriol. Well, I was convicted this week to, to just highlight the fact that I think many of our traditional structures that are keeping us as old wineskins is when we say, Lord Jesus, I will... I will be open to you as long as it fits within the structure of my political leanings. If I, if I am, as long as whatever somebody says is in alignment with my political leaning, I will be uh, open to receiving your grace, your truth uh, in, in, in my life. And Jesus is saying, you know, I don't want you to determine whether or not you're going to receive something from me based on whether or not it fits into your political persuasion. I want you to just be willing to abandon everything and be willing to receive me first and foremost. That's step number one. Not, okay, here's the structure, Lord. If you fit into it, then I'll receive it. And so we have people on all sides politically who are saying, here's my structure, and this, I'm, I'm not bending. I'm not moving. And so we have all these issues where we could be a case in some cases, like I've said, there is very clear dark and light. There is very clearly good and evil. But in, a, in, in some of the issues that we debate about politically, it's a case of we need iron to sharpen iron. I need to be elastic and pliable to, to consider that, that there is something I can learn from you. There is something I can glean from you that shouldn't be a threat, but that should just expand my mind and open my horizons in new ways. And, and instead, we have... We have political uh, structures and traditions, just like the Pharisees who were saying, I am unbending, I am unwilling. I don't want to receive Jesus because then I'm like that political person who says uh, they, they know Jesus and I don't want to be like them. Friends, Jesus wants to meet us as on square one. He wants us to open our lives to him as Savior and Lord. You know, I, I know that I could open up a huge can of worms, but I'll just give one issue. Uh, last week, I talked about the sanctity of life issue. I talked about immigration and how scriptures can lead people potentially to two different sides. And those are complex, uh, especially immigration. There can be compassion, order, all of those things. But what about racial justice that is a huge issue in our world today? And if we are hell-bent on keeping our political structures as the framework, framework by which we will receive what the Spirit of God might be saying. We are not going to be able to, to bridge divides and minister in the name of Jesus appropriately and effectively. See, we have one group that their political system says, racial justice problem? We don't have a racial justice problem. This is America. And then on the other side, you have 
people saying, well, the racial justice problem is that you are the problem. And so we need to bring about unity. And so to bring about unity, we're going to divide up everybody by their, racial, by their, by their race, and we're going to categorize everyone, and we're going to label who the oppressors are, oppressors are and who the oppressed are, and that's going to bring about unity and move us forward. And so we have these political systems. One, we don't have a problem. And the other political system says, well, you're the problem, and we're going to label you as the problem. And then if we can all agree that you're the problem, we will be able to move forward. And instead, Jesus says, wait a minute. Just be open to the moving of my Holy Spirit. That is not about trying to fix things by first entering into a way that fits with your political system. I come in and I do something new. And what if instead of being rigid old wineskins, if everybody, regardless of party, just said, Lord, Open my heart to see others as you see them. Open my heart to receive them with grace. Not to see them as an issue or as a political opponent, but just to, to listen to my common human, human creation of God who has a perspective that might be different and help me to receive them and what they have to say. Lord, expand my heart to have love for others as you love them. You know, we don't have to be fearful. If we're inviting Jesus to speak and move and bring reconciliation, we don't have to fear that. We just say, Lord, make me a new wineskin. And it may not look like what I envisioned it. It, it. You know what? I don't think that Jesus is going to bring about racial reconciliation through either of these approaches that I just described, where we either deny there's a problem or, or say that we need to label everybody and who the problem is. It's going to come through once again. Believers in Jesus proclaiming God's word. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. We are created in the image of God. Every person is precious. And I wish we would be willing to say as a society, we don't have to be in either or category. We don't have to divide up along party lines. We can come together and, and be one unified body through Jesus. And we can look at the African-American community and we can say, you know what, I hear your pain. I hear your voice. I, I recognize that your experience is not my experience and I want to listen from you, listen to you. I want to learn from you. And we can also look at a police officer who's going into work every day, putting his life on the line, every day going to do one of the most dangerous jobs in society, not knowing if he's going to return to his wife and kids. And we can look at the police officer and say, I admire you for the work that you do every day as you put on the badge. We love you. We hear you. We support you. We pray for you. This is not an either or. That is divisive. That's of the enemy. We are people of Jesus who say, I want to learn from you no matter who you are. No matter what, I want to learn from you, I want to listen to you. And I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit will give me wisdom that is in alignment with the scriptures as I, as I approach this issue. But we are not to be divided, uh, rigid old wineskins that are unable to listen and to consider broadened perspectives. We're called to be the body of Christ who listens and loves like Christ. Amen for, you know, I'm just a broken vessel that the Holy Spirit speaks to and knocks over the head every once in a while. So that's, this comes as I wrestle with God and the Lord convicts me and says, you know, because here's what happens. I go through Facebook and I think I could, I could respond to that person. I could respond to that person. I could respond to that person. And then the Lord says, let me just speak to you for a moment. Amen. That, and, and, and what does James say? You know, if we want to be a, a true follower of Christ, what does James say? Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. And you know what that means for us? Everyone should be quick to listen, meaning I should be quick to go to God's word. I should be quick to pray and say, Holy Spirit, how do you want to speak to me about this? But instead, we've reversed this. So it's, Lord, first I'm angry, so that means i got to speak, right? Is, is this we flip this whole thing on its head? I'm angry, so I need to speak, and that means I need to get my Twittery fingers going and my Twittery Facebook fingers going so that I can, you know, be angry and lash out and speak rather than just saying, Spirit of God, make me humble. I am not the arbiter of all truth. I am not the judge of Facebook and Twitter and every ridiculous thing that's said out in the public square. And if we would all go to Jesus first and say, Lord, I'm your servant. I'm listening to you first, and I'm listening to others. I realize I have two big ears and one mouth, and that means I should be listening at least twice as much as I'm speaking. And that's what an, an elastic, new wineskin heart does. It says, you know what? 
I'm, I'm, I'm praying for discernment as I listen to this person. I have a feeling I'm probably not going to agree with what they have to say, but I'm confident that if I listen, the Lord might be able to speak to... to if that person is 20% truth and 80% false... You know, the Holy Spirit can help me discern that and sift through it and maybe expand my heart while, uh, while having wisdom about the other part. But we need to be elastic and pliable and recognize that the Holy Spirit is going to bring newness of life and new reconciliation and new hope and bring people together through what God is doing. I was so encouraged, I listened recently to an interview with the, the, front, the, the front man from Skillet. And he was talking about how uh, pastors of different races were coming together and praying together in Wisconsin where there's been so much division. And that's, he was saying, it's not going to be, you know, denial of a problem. It's not going to be through rioting and setting fires. That's not how anything is going to be solved. But when God's people from different backgrounds of different races come together and pray and seek the face of the Lord and seek peace, that's how change is going to happen. Wineskins are elastic, and they expand. And finally, you know what wineskins are created for? Wineskins are created to be poured out. And so as we, God's people who, are, who humbly come before the Lord, seeking to be filled with love and peace and the fruit of the Spirit, as we come before the Lord seeking to be enlarged and expanded by the grace of God, uh, as people who are more Christ-like, and that should be our prayer, Lord, increase my heart capacity to love others as you love them, then we're in a position where we can say, Lord, thank you for the blessing and the opportunity to have my life poured out as an offering for you. Wherever I go, Lord, you are calling me to pour out the beautiful, good-tasting, free-flowing wine of the Holy Spirit that brings joy and that brings hope and that brings love wherever I go. And so my question is, how is God calling you to be poured out in a way that would bring blessing to those around you? You know, you know what happens? We get into the pressure cooker of life and we get squeezed. And as a wineskin, maybe we haven't been spending enough time with Jesus. And something gets poured out, but it might be a little bit of ugliness. It might be a little bit of cynicism. It might be a little bit of anger. And Jesus says, no, let me do this work in you. Let me fill you. Let me expand your heart with love and broaden perspective. And then let me invite you into the world with me so that you might be poured out so that you can make a difference wherever you go. Amen. I want to close with uh, this story, just as an example of how the Holy Spirit wants to uh, make someone a new wineskin. I read a powerful testimony in Firebrand magazine. It's a new magazine from a, a Wesleyan perspective, strongly based in God's word, and I encourage you to uh, check out Firebrand magazine. But there was a man named Eric Huffman, and believe it or not, he was a jaded, cynical, bitter pastor. He grew up in a strong Christian home to love Jesus, probably grew up at places like Camp Finley and Miracle Mountain Ranch where he was taught God's word. He went off to college where he became a bitter angry Christian that was way more focused on getting his ang angry viewpoint across than sharing the love of Christ in a, in a grace-filled way. And he, his sermons, he said, were all political diatribes. His behavior at home was just giving in to the addictive pull of pornography. He, was, he had God in a box. He had his structures. He thought, well, you know, Jesus was a good teacher, but he wasn't really God until Constantine came around and said that he was God. And this is how he lived. Without a true belief in Jesus as Savior and Lord and God, uh, without a, a really inside-out uh, love for the Lord, but it was just this angry, bitter way of uh, projecting and, and, and spewing out what he wanted to share. And I want to talk about how he, as an old, brittle wineskin, who was angry, addicted to pornography, living a lie, not believing that Jesus is the Son of God, he was invited to go on a trip to the Holy Land. And he thought, well, if I go to Israel, I can just, you know, I can see how um, the Palestinians are oppressed and I can, you know, this will be a good, helpful trip. And that's why he thought he was going. And he writes this after having an awakening in the Holy Land when he went to Israel. He says, I died in Capernaum. You know, that's what we need to do. We die to self. Those old wineskins die so that we can be made new. He said, I died in Capernaum, or at least the old Eric did. My wretched, divided life passed away the day I stood near the first century house where first-generation Christians gathered to worship in the years following Jesus' death. 
My tour guide was an archaeology enthusiast named Bert, and he told me all about the graffiti on the walls inside the ancient house church, engravings that read, Lord Jesus Christ and Christ have mercy, among other things. That part didn't surprise me. I knew Christians had been calling Jesus their God ever since the days of Constantine's Edict of Milan. See, he thought, oh, that was just something, that was a human invention that Jesus was God. People didn't really believe that or think that until Constantine, a few hundred years after Jesus' life. Moving on. But then Bert said, archaeologists have dated those etchings to the first half of the first century A.D., and I felt my ontological foundations trembling beneath my feet. One of my favorite weapons to use against evangelicals had always been the argument that Jesus' divinity was a later amendment to the original biblical narrative. What did it mean then that this Capernaum graffiti was scratched onto those walls at least 263 years before Constantine's edict and several decades prior even to the first gospel being written? It meant that the people who knew Jesus best, his friends, followers, and family, worshipped him as their God. I knew enough about Jewish scripture and beliefs to be certain that for any self-respecting Jew, worshipping a mere man was off limits. The rule against worshipping anyone but God sits atop the Ten Commandments. Not even Abraham, Moses, or Elijah was worthy of worship. But the faithful Jews who walked with Jesus, including some who watched him die, worshipped him post-mortem. That day in Capernaum, I was forced with history's most consequential question. Was Jesus just a man, or is he truly God? After a considerable amount of reflection, I came to the uncomfortable and shocking conclusion that Jesus is who he and his followers said he was, Emmanuel, God with us. See, this man was an old wineskin. He thought, I know everything about Jesus. I have Jesus in a box. He was a teacher, but he was not God. That's what the, his followers thought. But he went in to that house. That he saw that graffiti on the walls where people revered Jesus as Lord in the first century. And that crumbling structure, that old wineskin, he realized this cannot contain the truth of who Jesus is. And now his life is forever transformed because the, the true new wine of Jesus and his grace flowed into this man who was so bitter and addicted and cynical who had God in a box. And so as we close this morning, I just want to ask, how are we trying to keep Jesus at arm's length because we say, I don't want you to enter in to, unless you fit within my framework? I want to keep this behavior going. I want to keep this thinking going. I want to keep this anger going. I want to keep this patterns of living going, but I don't want you to enter in. Jesus says, no, 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 no. I want to be all in. Remember the lasso. I want to be all in. I want to take control. I want you to have a heart that is filled, a heart that is pliable and elastic, a heart that is willing to be poured out for my glory. May we receive Jesus and his new wine and into the new wineskins of our hearts that we might be the effective disciples and ambassadors he is calling us to be. Ambassadors of love. Ambassadors of true change. Ambassadors who go out into the world and, and unite people through, through the grace and the love of Christ that brings true healing, that brings true reconciliation, that brings true hope. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you are the new wine who wants to come into uh, your servants. God, forgive us when we are crusty, old uh, wineskins who are unwilling to yield and surrender to you. And, and Lord, today, uh, in, a, in a fresh new way, we say, Lord, fill me with your new wine and make me be a beautiful new wineskin who is ready to be used for you and your purposes. Lord, we know that we are simply empty vessels that have been created by you to be filled and poured out that we might live for your glory, that we might live to make your name known, that we might live to make your hope and the gospel of Jesus known to the world around us. And God, we pray that you would do that work in us. God, we know that we live in a world where so many are just bitter and angry. So many don't want true transformation. They want to continue to be Lord of their own lives. And Lord, you are calling, to be Lord, you are calling us to be uh, Lord of all. And so, Lord, we, sub we submit and we surrender to you. And we pray that as your, t as your people, we would be different because we 
experience your grace that flows in and changes us from the inside out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite us to just close with a time of worship. If you'd like to stand, you're invited to do that. But think about how Jesus wants to you, you how he's calling you to offer your heart, your life, your future uh, to him in a new way, in a surrendered way. Um, let's offer our lives and our gifts to the living God as we sing. Amen. Our hope is in Christ alone. He is the one we live for. He is the one who sends us out in his name. The statement that comes to my mind is just they will know we are Christians by our love. And I, as I say, you know, let's be prayerful, let's have wisdom, and, and let's live out and speak out our convictions, but that the world will know we are believers when we live with love, the love of Jesus. So may the new wine of the Holy Spirit flow into us so that we might manifest all the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit, that the world will be attracted to what we have to offer as we seek to share and proclaim Christ with our lives so good to be in worship. If there's any way that our church can serve you, if you need somebody to talk to or pray with, you want to learn more about knowing Christ, uh, if there's any way that we can help, please don't uh, hesitate to contact us. Reach out. We'd love to hear from you. As you go from this place, ready to be new wine in a world that is desperate to see the goodness of Christ through his people, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week.